Hey, it's Mr. Shrum, and today we're going to look at the digestive and excretory systems. So my favorite topic, that's a joke. So uh, let's get into the whole objective of this lesson. We're going to use a model to explain how the digestive and excretory systems interact with the circulatory system to provide energy to cells and eliminate waste. There's the contents and then let's get into the warm up questions. All right, so when people experience indigestion, you know, when your stomach's upset, whatever, they often take an antacid to soothe their stomachs. Do you think taking an antacid is effective? Explain your answer. And well, simple answer. The stomach is extremely acidic um, and we'll see that in later slides. Antacids temporarily neutralize the acid and soothe the stomach. So antacid, like anti-acid. So it, it helps uh, the stomach feel a little better. And then which organs are part of the excretory system? The answer is already showing. So we have the bladder, kidneys, lungs, and skin. So some of these are probably some you did not uh, immediately think of, but the lungs and skin play a part as well. There's the video. And let's get into the digestive system. All right, everyone knows this old saying, you are what you eat. Eating a cheeseburger at lunch will certainly calm a grumbling stomach, but the digestive system will also break it down to uh, use its nutrients for body processes and to build new tissue. The digestive system performs two types of digestion. Mechanical digestion, the food breaks down into tiny little particles. Chemical digestion, enzymes, you remember what enzymes are. These are uh, substances that act as catalysts for chemical reactions in living things. And those little guys break down the molecules in food into smaller units that the body can use. Here are the main parts of the digestive system. Uh, it's made up of the alimentary canal the body structures that food passes through from mouth to, yes, your anus, and a few other organs like the liver, the pancreas, which all play a pretty important role in the process of digestion. The alimentary canal is a long tube of connected organs that extends from the mouth all the way to your anus. The average length of a human alimentary canal is about 30 feet, which is pretty amazing considering that it's about five times longer than a average sized six foot adult. The mouth, esophagus, stomach, and intestines make up the alimentary canal. And we're gonna discuss the function of each of those. The mouth this is where you put your food um, for most people. This is uh, where it undergoes mechanical digestion. Your teeth chew the food, your saliva moistens it, makes it easier for you to swallow. And at the same time, amylase, this is an enzyme in your saliva, begins breaking down starch into simple sugars. The moistened food can be swallowed and the soft mass of food is called a bolus. See here, bolus of food, that green loaf. And then we're gonna watch it go through your entire body. The esophagus, after the mouth, the bolus, the piece of food enters the esophagus. And this is a long muscular tube that transports food from the throat or pharynx all the way to the stomach. The esophagus is lined with smooth muscles that contract in a wave-like motion to propel the food through the digestive tract. This process is called peristalsis. When food is swallowed, 
a small flap of skin called the epiglottis covers the trachea or windpipe. This action prevents food from entering the trachea, which could cause a person to uh, choke. If food enters the windpipe by mistake, the respiratory system initiates the coughing reflex to expel the food. So now we're in your stomach, right? The food has entered the stomach. The esophagus transports bolus to the stomach and the stomach, as you know, or may already know, it's like a sack. It's an organ filled with uh, very acidic uh, properties. It lies between the esophagus and the small intestine. It has three overlapping layers of smooth muscles. The mucous membrane that lines the stomach contains gastric glands that secrete gastric juices. And these juices contain hydrogen chloride, potassium chloride, and sodium chloride. This acidic solution lowers the pH in the stomach to around two. And if you remember pH, the lower the pH, the more acidic a solution is. And this acidic environment in the stomach is favorable for the enzyme pepsin, which breaks down proteins, but it may damage the stomach. And to protect the stomach lining from the acidic environment, cells in the stomach lining secrete mucus. So mucus is protecting the stomach lining. Bolus, so the food particles that you have chewed up and swallowed, passes down the esophagus, gastric juices and muscle contractions help digest food. Uh, here's the pyloric sphincter, and then chyme enters the duodenum. Now, bolus is what we call the chewed up food. And this sphincter, it's a, a valve. So it, it doesn't let things go backwards. It closes quickly and it pre prevents the bolus from moving backwards back into the stomach. Now the stomach muscles contract and help in mechanical digestion. At the same time, the muscles mix the food with gastric juices to convert the bolus into a pulpy, semi-liquid substance called chyme. So bolus goes through the stomach, and now it's kind of liquidy, and we call that chyme. The, walnut, the walnut-shaped sphincter at the end of the stomach outlet holds the chyme in the stomach until it uh, reaches the correct consistency. So it has to be a certain uh, consistency before it moves on to the small intestine. Most foods require a little more digestion and are absorbed by the small intestine. But some substances, substances such as alcohol and aspirin are directly absorbed through the stomach wall. Okay. All right, checkpoint question. Peptic ulcers are sores in the lining of the intestine. An infection caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori often causes these ulcers. The bacteria live in the mucus layer of the stomach. As the bacteria grow and reproduce, they can damage this lining. Here's the normal stomach, and here's an ulcer. If you can see that um, tiny spot there, that's the ulcer. What symptoms do you think a peptic ulcer would cause? Why do you think these symptoms would occur? And the sample answer we have, people with peptic ulcers feel a burning pain during digestion, digestion because the bacteria thrive in the mucus layer of the stomach and weakens it. The cell in the stomach lining don't secrete enough mucus to combat uh, the acidic effects of gastric juices the acid gets through the lining and that leads to inflammation and pain. So that's not fun if you've ever had an ulcer. Now, before we discuss the digestion process further, we're gonna look at some of the accessory organs. So these organs produce chemical secretions that facilitate chemical digestion in the small intestine. Pancreas. 
This is a large organ near the stomach. And pancreatic juice is a clear alkaline fluid that contains enzymes and substances that aid chemical digestion. The pancreatic ducts produce these enzymes that break down biomolecules. Amylase breaks down starch, lipase breaks down lipids, which are fats, trypsin and chymotrypsin, chymotrypsin. Let me double check this. Yeah, read a lot. Chymotrypsin. Juice is alkaline. Chymotrypsin, which breaks down proteins. Okay, okay. Chymotrypsin, which breaks down proteins. So amylase, lipase, trypsin, chymotrypsin. Pancreatic juice is alkaline because the pancreas secretes bicarbonate atoms and uh, bicarbonate ions, excuse me, and raises the pH of the food to seven. Alkaline, uh, more basic. Okay, it neutralizes the acidic chyme uh, released by the stomach, creating a favorable environment for the enzymatic action. The pancreas also secretes insulin, a hormone that regulates blood glucose levels. Liver, this is the largest internal organ of the body. You can see that right there. And the liver produces bile. Bile helps with fat digestion through a process called emulsification. Emulsification allows the pancreatic enzyme lipase uh, to break down fats more easily. Then we have your smaller gallbladder. It's a sac-like organ right beneath the liver. It stores bile before releasing it to the duodenum. Duodenum. Excuse me. And then we have the bile duct, and that carries the pancreatic juices and bile to the duodenum. Duodenum. Let me move on. The small intestine, after food is converted into a uh, chyme. in the stomach. It continues farther down the chyme. It doesn't sound right, but we'll go with it. After food is converted into chyme in the stomach, it continues farther down the digestive system and enters the small intestine through the process of peristalsis. The small intestine is a muscular tube about seven meters, about 23 feet long. It's called small because of its narrow diameter here, food gets mixed with digestive juices and is propelled farther through the digestive tract. The small intestine is divided into three segments, duodenum, uh, jejunum, the ileum. Let's see how these segments work together to facilitate digestion. The uh, duodenum, chyme enters the first and shortest segment of the small intestine the duodenum, duodenum. The bile duct empties its contents, which contain pancreatic juices and bile into the duodenum. These chemical secretions mix with the chyme in the duodenum to facilitate chemical digestion. And the duo, uh, duodenum connects the stomach to the jejunum. After chemical digestion in the duodenum, chyme enters this middle segment of the small intestine. And here it absorbs most of the nutrients from the digested food and the circulatory system takes these nutrients to different parts of the body. The uh, jejunum has special adaptations to enable absorption. Nutrients from the digested food pass into the blood vessels of the intestine, 
through simple diffusion. The inner wall of the small intestine is covered in folds and lined with epithelial tissue. And this tissue is just one cell thick to allow diffusion. The folds have small finger-like projections called villi. Villi have finger-like projections called microvilli, so smaller villi. And the purpose of the folds, the villi, and the microvilli is to increase the surface area of absorption. Each villus, which is the singular form of villi, has a network of capillaries, which are small blood vessels, like we talked before, uh, talked about before, and lymphatic vessels. Those are part of the lymphatic system, and we'll talk about that system later. Capillaries absorb amino acids and sugars, while lymphatic vessels absorb fats. Villi absorb micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals for circulation. And then finally, the ileum. So the jejunum absorbs about 90% of nutrients present in food, but the jejunum doesn't absorb nutrients such as vitamin B12 and bile salts. The ileum is the last segment of the small intestine and this uh, part absorbs those nutrients. The circulatory system takes the absorbed nutrients and then transports them to other organs for use. Undigested chyme enters the large intestine. If the small intestine fails to completely absorb the nutrients, it leads to a condition called malabsorption. A symptom of malabsorption is indigestion, which leads to diarrhea, excessive gas, and bloating. These symptoms occur because the body doesn't completely break down and absorb food. The causes of malabsorption include an underlying disease, certain medications, and lack of an enzyme. Okay. And here's a good picture of all the interacting parts. Finally, the large intestine. Um, so after all that, you're now in the large intestine. The cecum uh, receives chyme from the ileum, and the cecum is a sac between the small intestine and the large intestine, which is also called the colon. The cecum connects the ileum to the colon. The colon is about 1.5 meters or five feet long. It's twice as wide as the small intestine. And a sphincter called the ileocecal valve uh, controls the passage of chyme. It separates the small intestine and the large intestine. Near this valve, there's a small finger-like organ called the appendix. The primary function of the colon is to absorb water. Undigested chyme becomes more and more solid as it absorbs water and is converted to feces. Peristalsis along the colon carries feces to the rectum. And the rectum stores feces until it can be expelled from the body. The feces then exit the body through the anus, as you can see here. Feces contains indigestible plant fibers and bacteria. About 400 different species of bacteria make up gut flora, which live in the colon. Some bacteria, some bacteria are also found in the upper digestive tract, but mostly they inhabit the lower intestinal tract. Bacteria such as E. coli produce enzymes required to make vitamins such as vitamin B and vitamin K. These vitamins are absorbed into the bloodstream through the intestinal walls. Gut flora inhibit the growth of harmful microorganisms and protect the body from infection. In addition, bacteria ferment indigestible carbohydrates such as cellulose. People who are lactose intolerant are unable to break down the milk sugar lactose in the small intestine because of a deficiency 
of the lactase enzyme. So the intact lactose reaches the large intestine where bacteria ferment it. Fermentation results in gas formation, formation leading to abdominal discomfort. The discomfort is why people who are lactose intolerant complain of an upset stomach when they consume milk or milk products. The enteric nervous system. The gut has its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. It's often referred to as the second brain or the brain in the gut. The enteric nervous system is part of the autonomous nervous system. The gut contains about 100 million neurons. The enteric nervous system functions independently, but it communicates with the central nervous system through the vagus nerve for uh, normal digestive functions. This link can have either a sympathetic or a parasympathetic effect. And I'll end right there.